Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Father, we just thank you, first and foremost, on this special occasion. Lord, we thank you for this house. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to, have to come into this place to worship you, to lift you up, Lord, to, to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit and your words speaking into our hearts and into our lives. And Lord, we thank you for the gift that is the Rock Church to our lives. And Father, we thank you for all that you've done in this house and for the leaders. We ask that you would bless this house, bless Pastor Jim and Pastor Deborah and the leaders all throughout uh, their lives, God, for what they have done and sown into the kingdom of God that we might be here today to hear from you. And with that, Lord, we acknowledge we don't come to hear from a man or from a woman, but we come to hear from you. And we ask that the Holy Spirit today would be our teacher, would, to be, would lead us and guide us and direct us and motivate us to be who you've called us to be, instruct us out of your word, Lord, your truth and your precepts, that we might be obedient and fulfilled in our lives here on earth, Lord, and blessed because of it. And we thank you, Father, for all that you've given to us. We ask on this day, on our birthday celebration, that you'd bless all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world, Lord, as we are co-laborers in the body of Christ, working together to build uh, the kingdom of God for your glory. Lord, to you be the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, today it's exciting because we're going to wrap up our six-part series on the blessed life. How many of you guys have been with us through the blessed life series? Has any of you guys been here? All right, praise God. I believe that you've been getting some great things out of that. If you haven't, I really want to encourage you. I don't want to take a lot of time to do so, but I want to encourage you that you need to go either online at rockchurch.com forward slash messages, or I don't know what it is, rockchurch.com, click the messages button, wherever it might be. You need to go online and listen to the previous messages because it's all a series. They all work together. Each one of them might be independent of each other, but you need to get a hold of what the Spirit of God has been showing us out of His truths and out of His Word and His will. And I believe that when we do, we will experience the blessed life from God. And today we're going to conclude on that subject, and I'm excited for that. As well as we're celebrating our two-year anniversary and our final year going into Freedom for Our Future. If you don't know what Freedom for Our Future is, maybe you're new or you've just been with us for a little while, Freedom for Our Future is our capital stewardship campaign or our program that we've brought into or we've entered into for the past two years and we're in one more year and then we're done uh, to reduce and to retire the mortgage balance of this church. And you'll hear a little bit about that as to why towards the end of today. But let's get into the Word of God. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to Luke in the ninth chapter. Luke chapter 9. The title of this message today is The Principles of Multiplication. I'm going to ask you a question. The answer should be obvious. Now, and I'm going to say this, and I don't want it to be offensive, but anybody with half of a brain in their head would say yes to this question. So I'm already told, I've already told you the answer. The question I want to ask you today is, do you want God, or how about even like this, would you like for God to multiply your resources? Yes. Yeah. As I say, anybody, everybody would answer that. No matter who you are, you want God to give you more. Absolutely, we're all that way. And when I look at that subject, when I say that subject to that question, multiply your resources, I don't want you to think singularly for just a moment. Don't just think finances. While finances are a huge part of our resources, that's not the only thing we have. If you think about resources, are relationships, their connections, their, their open doors here and, and up opportunities there. Resources are what we have at hand in our lives today. And God, God's desire for us whether you know it or not, is for us or for him to multiply our resources. But we have to understand some principles of multiplication. Man, I love that word. We've heard about addition. We've heard about subtraction. Today, we get to hear about multiplication, that mathematical term of going over and above, that Ephesians 3.20, above what we can ask, think, or wish. That's what God's desire is for us. And today, I want to take you into Luke, the ninth chapter. We're going to read and encounter one of the miracles of Jesus and his disciples. Before we do, let me give you a little bit of background. Here, Jesus had just sent his disciples out to go do ministry. He told them, don't take money, don't take extra clothes, don't make a plan. You just get out there, you spread the word of God that I have taught you. When somebody hears you, they bring you into their house, stay with them. If they don't, shake the dust off your feet and keep on going. So the disciples have been sent out by Jesus, and they're just returning. They're all coming back, and they're just amazed. I mean, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. I mean, they're just like literally have experienced the power of God at work in their lives and trusting that God will provide for them. And so as the story continues in the book of Luke in the ninth chapter, Jesus tells them, he says, okay, let us retreat to a wilderness, a deserted place. They're going to go to a place where they can kind of get a little bit of respite, a little bit of a rest, just to kind of rec recollect and, and kind of, you know, come down off of that high that they were on so they can continue doing what they were doing. 
Well, as the Word of God tells us that the crowds, the people, the followers of Jesus heard that Jesus and his disciples were in the wilderness area and they began to follow Jesus into the wilderness area. And as he, is, as he always is, moved with compassion, Jesus begins to speak to his people, to this, to this great crowd that is following him into the wilderness areas. And so now we pick up in the book of Luke in the ninth chapter and let's go there and let's read this story, this principles of multiplication. And here we'll pull some truth and we'll pull some, uh, um, some words and wisdom out of the word of God for us today as Jesus, I believe, is speaking to us through this story. Verse number 12, it says that when the day began to wear away, the 12 came and said to him, send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and get provisions. For we are in a deserted place. Now, I love it how the disciples, they're the ones that come to Jesus. Jesus is teaching. So just imagine, I I like it when we we read stories, it's neat to read a story, but I think it's really cool if you can read a story and kind of put yourself in that story. Like, what if this was me? What if I was Peter right now? Like, what would it be like? So just imagine here, the disciples, they've just come off this journey of trusting in God. And now Jesus is teaching to the multitudes, and the Bible says that when the day began to wear away, you know what that means? It was a long day. Jesus started early in the morning, and he was teaching, and he was teaching, and they're looking at the the sun, like, thinking, like, okay, it's about lunchtime. He's probably going to wrap it up. It keeps going. All right, well, you know, my bread and my food is to do the will of God. Okay, we'll keep going, and the sun keeps moving. It keeps moving, and it's getting low in the sky. And they're saying, you know what, man? I'm hungry. They're looking at each other saying, you know what? Are you hungry? I'm hungry. I'm tired. I've been on my feet for a long time. So they come to Jesus, and they say, Jesus, we, we so appreciate this word, I mean, this, 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 this message that you've been delivering the entire day, it's just, it's changing our lives. But the people, the people, not us, no, 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 we're, we're, we're holy. We don't need, we, we could go all day. The people, Jesus, they, they're, they're getting weary. They're getting tired. It's all day. They, they need to get some food. And we are in a deserted place, remember? You see, the, the, we, we're a long way away from restaurant row after a Sunday morning. So can, can we kind of wrap this up? And, uh, you know, send them home. We'll come back tomorrow, you know, continue part number two, whatever it might be. And, and let's just send them home. And I love what Jesus' response to his disciples is. He looks to them and he says, but he said to them, you give them something to eat. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Jesus, uh, we have only limited resources. Have you ever had, uh, maybe at, at your job, or maybe your experience is on the other, and maybe at your job, you were trying to give somebody vision. Man, we want to go here. We we're going to go to this new place, or we're going to do this new thing, or we're going to try this. We're going to expand the company. And, and, and you've either thought to yourself, like, there's no way we can do that because you don't have a clue what, what it takes to do that. You know, the, the boss comes in, and they just lay out the vision, and you're the one that has to carry it out. And you're like, that ain't happening. And so the disciples, they kind of come to Jesus, and you give them something to eat, and they look at this crowd. And they kind of say, I don't think he quite understands the resources we have at the moment. Let's let's just tell Jesus. Let's make him aware because maybe he he told us that unaware of of, of everything that we had. So the disciples come back and they say, well, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all of these people. For there were about 5,000. So here the disciples say, Jesus, I mean, it's really... we learned to trust in you this last time. It was so cool how you provided for us. We didn't take money and we didn't take extra clothes. And God, you were, God showed up. It was really cool. But, but I don't think you quite understand, okay? There, there's like 5,000. Now, the book of Matthew tells us in the same story, the book of Matthew tells us that there was about 5,000 men, not including women and children. So, I mean, let's just think about this for a moment. If there was one woman or one child for every one man, that's a crowd, mathematically speaking, of at minimum 10,000 people. Now, assuming that there was a, wa- a wife here and there, and, and you know, they didn't have birth control, so if you had one kid, you had like five kids. So, this is somewhere between the crowd of 10 and 25,000 people. Many scholars believe and theologians believe this is at, at the largest crowd Jesus ever addressed at one time in his ministry, right here. And so the disciples said, Jesus, I don't think you quite understand what you just said to us. You just told us to feed them. There's like 20,000 people. So let's give them the worst case scenario. Jesus, we've got two fish and five loaves. A little boy walked by and he stopped off at Rubio's right before you started preaching and he bought two fish tacos and a couple extra bags of chips. That's all we got. It was Taco Tuesday. Unless, Jesus, you want us to go and buy food for everybody, but you know 
Who controls the money box? Judas. We talked about that last week. So you know we don't have enough money to buy food for all of these people. So they're kind of presenting this worst case scenario. I love how when we come to try to argue with God a little bit, God, I cannot do that. He, he doesn't make life any easier. He goes on and he says, okay, make them sit down in groups of 50. Have you ever seen a large crowd? Have you ever noticed how difficult it is? I mean, if you've ever been around people in any given capacity in a crowd, people are difficult, right? I mean, they're harder to control than cattle and sheep. I mean, people have died in stampedes from humans. And Jesus says, okay, not only do I want you to feed them with what you have, now I want you to take this crowd of 20 or 25,000 people and control them. Get them into groups of 50. I mean, he is presenting a monumental challenge to his disciples. But the Bible tells us that they did that. They made them all sit down. And he says he took those five loaves and the two fish. Looking up to heaven, he blessed and he broke them. And he gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. And they ate. They all ate. What does all ate mean? They all ate. Not the disciples all ate. Man, Jesus, we were the ones that were hungry. Praise God. You know, the, 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 12, the, the 12 disciples were the ones. We needed five fish and two loaves. And so Jesus blessed them. No, they all ate. The crowd all ate. And we're filled. Okay, so this wasn't just a crumb. All right, that word, we're filled, means they didn't just disperse like literally a microscopic crumb to each person to see how far can we make this go. And it goes on and it tells us they all ate and they were filled and 12 baskets, 12 doggy bags were taken up by them. All right, so at the beginning of the story, we start with two fish and five loaves. At the end, we end up with 12 baskets of fragments left over from a crowd of anywhere of 10 to 25,000 people being fed. This is a story of a miraculous multiplication. And I believe here in this story, we can see some things because the disciples had resources. Their resources seemed insignificant and, and useless at the time. Two fish and five loaves. But you remember that question I said, would you like God to multiply your resources? The resources they had at hand, God multiplied. And I believe here we can see some principles of multiplication for us to apply in the resources that we have. It may be a lot, may be a few. You, some of you may say, I have none, but you have something in your hand right now. Two fish and five loaves, somewhere, something. And so today I want to take a quick look at these principles of multiplication in regards to our resources. When we take our resources and we do what God wants, then we begin to see this multiplication in our lives. So two quick and easy things for us to understand today. The very first principle of multiplication for us to understand today is that our resources, it has to be blessed before it can be multiplied. It has to be blessed before it can be multiplied. It's not just anything off the street can be multiplied. It's not just, okay, well, there it is, Abrakazam and Alakazoo or whatever it might be. It has to be blessed by God, our resources, before they can begin to multiply. If you look back at the story in verse number 16 in, in Luke the ninth chapter, it says that Jesus, he took the loaves and he took the fish and he looked up to heaven and he blessed them. You see, imagine if Jesus would have told the disciples this word, this word you feed them. Like he said. And so they look to each other and they say, well, what do we have? We have fish and we have loaves. And before they handed them over to Jesus, before they were blessed, imagine them trying to disperse or to distribute that measly little boy's lunch to the crowd of 10 to 25,000 people. It would not have gone very far, very far, right? This was a portion for a little boy. A couple sardines and some salsas, some chips and salsa. That's about all it was. And so yet, here they gave it to Jesus, and there it was blessed. You see, in our lives, we have to live a life where our lives, our finances are blessed before we can allow them or believe that God will multiply them. Well, you know, Pastor Luke, I, I give a little bit here, and I give a little bit there, and I give a little bit there, and I'm a giver to the church. You know, I give like 5% to the church over here, and I give about 3.5% over here to this missionary organization, and I give a little bit over here to my kids' Christian school, and, 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 and a little bit over there to that TV preacher, and, 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 and I give. But you see, we learned over the past five weeks what God says about our finances being blessed. We wonder, how do I get my finances blessed? We've learned that over the past couple of weeks. And simply it's this. Give to God what is His, the first, bring it into the storehouse or the church, and steward what is the rest. 
And then your, your money, your finances, your resources will come out from that spirit of humanity, that spirit of the world, of mammon that says, I don't need God. And now the spirit of God will rest upon. And like the Bible says, I will rebu rebuke the devourer for your sake. Now, all of a sudden, when you give in to God because you've done what God has instructed you to do, your life will be blessed. God will not, cannot bless you if your life is out of order. And any logical parent would understand that precept. If my child's on the ground flopping and screaming and throwing a temper tantrum, in that moment, I will not bless them. As a matter of fact, whatever it is that they're throwing a temper tantrum over, likely is going to get picked up and thrown in the trash just to teach them a lesson that that will not get by in my house. So if your finances are out of order, God will not bless your finances. So how do you get your finances in order? By doing what God said to do. To bring to God what is his and to steward the rest, like we talked about in the breaking of the spirit of mammon. Now, I remember during the course of this Freedom for Our Future campaign, you know, we knew that this was going to be a financial revolution. We knew that this was going to change a lot of things in the church, in our lives, in the people, wherever it might be. So when my wife and I, we got together, we prayed. We said, God, what is it that you want to do? Because God is a God of, of direction. God is not a God who sows confusion. He's a God who gives to us peace and direction and wisdom when we need of it. So we asked of God, God, during this course, what is it that we need to do to get our life in direction and in alignment with you. And God gave to me three things. Now, you need to go to God and you need to ask God what it is in your life you need to do to get your finances in order. Obviously, the answer will be give to God what is his and steward the rest. But God gave to me three direct and very um, um, concise directions. And I believe that this was God's word to me, but I believe it's sound financial advice. So that's what I'm going to tell you. God told us in the very beginning of this, when we sought the Holy Spirit's leading on the freedom for our future, he told us to continue to tithe. Don't ever stop. We were already tithers. Don't back off. Don't relent to continue to tithe like, like we saw in the testimony videos. We never stopped about that. The second one was to get out of debt, to be a good steward of what we had left over. You see, we had bought two brand new cars hot off the lot. They weren't MSRP because I'm a haggler. It was fun. But we still had two brand new cars, two brand new car payments. We had a pretty hefty credit card bill. We had some appliance payments. We had a mattress payment. We had payments coming out of everywhere. Bills coming in all over the place. And so God spoke to us to be good stewards of what we have and to get ourselves out of debt. And the third thing God spoke to us was to give, to be generous, to give into the kingdom of God. So what we thought naturally, okay, here it is. We'll tithe like we do. We'll work on getting out of debt. And then once we get out of debt, we'll give. It's a logical conclusion. Like it's, it's step one, step two, step three. God spoke to us to do it all. <laughs> uh, uh, God, did you see our budget? We, we did that. We, we wrote it down. Did, you want, we, we can't do it all. But we decided, you know, we're going to trust in God. We're going to trust in God and do what he said. Because if we believe, if we do what he says, our finances will be in order and God will bless us. So we began. I bought a book. Find total, total Money Makeover from Dave Ramsey. I read the book. Very simple. Followed doing what it was. Followed what he said to do. Very simple, very easy. So we started doing that. We worked on getting out of debt. We've paid off our credit card. We've paid off our cars. We've paid off all the bills. Now here we are giving into freedom for our future. We're looking back at our bank account. We're looking at our finance and say, we don't have debt. And it's amazing because right after we decided to do that, we were given a raise at the church here. And because of the, the growing responsibilities, since you guys are growing in responsibility, you needed to get a raise. And we said, man, the raise is like perfect. God, it's your answer to cover our problems. It's the amount we need to give. And so, but we, we went to the Lord and we prayed and we said, God, what, what, what do you want us to do? And God said, you know, I want, you got into this problem on your own. Money's not the answer to your problems, me. I'm the answer to your problems. And so we prayed and we just sat with his peace and say, okay, you know what? For the time being, for the season, we're going to give it back because we don't want that to be the answer to our problems. We got into our problems this way, we're going to get out of our problems trusting God. So we gave that back and we began to give and we began to sow into the kingdom of God. And my wife and I, we were sitting there on Friday afternoon as we were thinking about this and we added up what the raise would have equaled over the course of the year and it was a couple thousand dollars and it was really cool. I mean, it was like, it would have been great. And we said, God, we're, we're going to just kind of do this. We're going to trust you to get our lives into alignment with you, to get our finances in order. And we added up our income what, between having puppies or Stacy getting a real estate license and having a commission or uh, we got a, a, a settlement. We didn't even know we moved into a house that had a lawsuit going on, got a settlement from that and tax returns over here and money just kept coming in. We looked at it and we said, it was, amount, it was about the amount of 10 times of what that raise would have equaled up God had given to us an income that we did not expect or did not plan. Why? Because when our finances in order, the principle of multiplication comes into effect. It has to be blessed before it can multiply. The second principle, in the same verse, 
here as it, looks, as it says is it must be given. Your resources must be given before it can multiply, before they can multiply. I know that's a tough one. That's like, man, I wish you wouldn't have said that one. I was good with number one. Number two, I'm not quite so sure about. I get it. But look what it says here in verse number 16. It says that when he took the fish and he took the loaves, he, he blessed them and he broke them. I mean, put yourself in Peter's position right now. Or James or John, whoever you think it might have been that handed Jesus all this, this fish and the loaves. I, you give him a full loaf. Okay, Jesus, this is, this is my bread. Okay, this, this is my resource. Everybody else, they're going to fend for their own thing. But I, I claim this piece of bread as my resource to distribute. Here it is. Jesus took it and he broke it and he gives him half back. Uh, but, but wait a minute, Jesus. I, I, I gave you a whole and um, you gave me less back. I need that whole piece of bread to feed my group. Of, see that group of 50 over there? Those, those guys? That's my group. Okay, and I need, I need that piece. Of, so they go over with that little half a piece of bread, that little half a piece of fish, and they say, okay, all right. Jesus blessed it. You know, here we go. Okay, little crumb. Okay, okay, good, good, good. Okay, pass it down. Crumb. Okay. Hey, hey, that's too much. Break that in half. Give that to the other person over here. And they pass it down. And they begin to pass it down. Because, you know, the disciples are probably thinking, well, I remember that story in the Bible where Elisha, he, he, he miraculously fed 100 men off of a bowl of soup. And so I, they thought, you know what, Jesus, when he prays for the bread, when he prays for the fish, it's just going to grow. It's going to multiply. It's going to come out from the background and just overflow. And, and so they're thinking, okay, I've got to give it to Jesus and let him bless it. And then he hands them back half a piece of bread. Okay. What if they would have said, well, Jesus blessed it. Let's just eat it. And let's just trust that God would have done it. What if they would have just ate it? What if they wouldn't have distributed it? What if they wouldn't have given it away? You see, the question for you and I is, we have resources that have the potential by God for multiplication, but if we don't do anything with them, they'll never multiply. So they're the disciples. They hand out that little bread. They hand it out, and they're thinking, okay, man, this is, I don't know how this is going to work because it didn't grow in Jesus' hands. So we're going, to look, we're going to look a little silly right here. And all of a sudden, they get to the group of 50, and he gets some bread back, and he gets some fish back. And he looks up at the group of 15 and he says, man, you guys are amazing. You guys are so selfless. You guys, you, you, you thought about the other person. None of you ate. I mean, how cool is that that you just decided for the betterment of somebody else that you wouldn't eat? And all of a sudden, everybody looks up and says, no, we got our bread and we got our fish. We got our food too. And he looks down at the fish and the loaves and he looks down at the bread and he looks down at them. But I, I gave them a half and I still have and they have. And um, how? Because it was when they gave it. It was when it was in the hands of the people that the principle of multiplication came into effect and now all of a sudden their resources were multiplied to the point where they received 12 baskets of fragments left over. It has to be given away before it can multiply. Now I am so guilty of being in this group, but I am a giver. Yes, right? You say the same thing. I'm a giver. I tithe. I'm a giver. Tithers are givers. Well, Tithing is not giving. Ugh. Uh. Tithing is returning. Ah. Oh, pull that knife out, right? I know. Giving, multiplication comes from over and above by giving what you steward that is left over from God. And you see, when you give, when you trust in God, now you're saying, God, this is what I have left. I'm going to use it. Remember we talked about this? To build the kingdom of God so that my friends who I have made from the, the, from the resources of this world will welcome me into an everlasting kingdom. Remember that? I'm going to give into the kingdom of God so that it will expand and grow. And in return, the principles of multiplication come on our resources. It's so simple. The question is, are you going to trust God or not. I remember there was a time when the church we were in, uh, the, 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 the staff we were in this um, spending freeze, we call them, when the, when the budget doesn't quite add up and giving was low or whatever it might be. So we say, hey, ain't nobody buying nothing right now. If that pencil breaks, you better pray over it, put some duct tape around it, because, you know, if your eraser is gone, you need to lick your finger and just, you know, what, what you got to do. That's how we survive sometimes. So I remember we were in there, and the video department was talking, man, we really want this, this teleprompter so that when we film the video announcements that you saw, that the person can look directly right into the camera and speak to everybody instead of, like, looking off to the side and telling the video announcements or whatever like this. And my wife, I had bought her an iPad for her birthday a, a year or so before, and it was a nice iPad. She really liked it. And we kind of looked at each other. Well, I kind of looked at her. And I was like, hey, babe, we ought to give that to the church so the video department can use it. And we kind of looked at each other and said, okay, well, whatever. You know, we have a computer. We have our phone. We don't need the iPad. It was cool, but we didn't need it. 
Well, we gave the iPad to the church, and the video department used it, and the church used it for other purposes. It was really cool. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, this new iPad came out, the smaller one, you know? And I was like, oh, it's like just the same size as my Bible. I really like that. God, I want an iPad. Is that so bad? And so I said, well, we're not going to go into debt. We're not going to charge the credit card for it. We're, we're, we've got a mission. We're not buying things that we don't need. There's a dis- difference between want and need. Amen? So we said, God, I want one, but I'm not going to, you know, I don't need one. So sure enough, January of the next year, all of a sudden, I was given an iPad. Here, Pastor Luke, here's an iPad for you. I was like, and it was the one I wanted. It was that little mini one. I was like, this is so, God, I gave my wife's iPad. Amen. <laughs> and I got an iPad in return. It was so cool. Well, then all of a sudden, my wife saw my iPad, and she's like, I like that little smaller one. It's cool. It's easier to carry around. It's not as heavy. It's a little bit more compact. She's like, I want an iPad. I'm like, okay, well, maybe for Christmas, for, you know, we'll get you one, and we'll, we'll look at it. I went to a conference in October. I was talking about buying her a Christmas present for her iPad. I went to a conference in October. The pastor took everybody to the back room. And he says, hey, I, I got a gift for you guys. Here's an iPad. I'm like, are you kidding me? I just got an iPad for me, and I just got a free iPad for my wife. I mean, that's so cool. I gave one away. I got two back. And then sure enough, in December, we had our staff Christmas party. Well, the, the, the rock. Now, there's a lot of scandal involved in this, but I swear to you, it was honest and just. But everybody got a little raffle card. And every time you participated in, a, in a, an event or a ticket or something, you get a raffle ticket. So I had a bunch of raffle tickets. And so then they're doing the raffle, and I didn't win it. we didn't win anything. And it was the last, it was the grand prize in the raffle was the iPad. Sure enough, I won the iPad. Three iPads in one year. I had more iPads in my house than people. So, of course, what did we do? We gave it back to the church and said, you know, everybody's, oh, this was cheap. They're crying foul place. I'm like, fine, just give it back. We didn't need it anyways. But God was showing the lesson. When you have resources and you give it away, even if it costs you, even if it hurts, even if it's a sacrifice, the principles of multiplication come into effect when you are blessed by God. And all of a sudden, God comes over and above. I asked for one iPad. I got three. Now, y'all can send me another one. That's okay, and I'll keep going. We'll keep telling the story next week. And I'm just kidding. But you see, what it boils down to is, are you going to trust God or not? Are you going to trust God or not? Because this has been called the blessed life. Why? Because we believe this is the cure to the cancer of this valley, the cure of poverty to say, I can never get out of the position that I'm in, and the cure of entitlement to say that my problems are not my responsibility, but somebody else's. No! Your life is your responsibility to do what God has instructed you to do with your resources. And when you do and follow God's word, you will be blessed. And the principles of multiplication will come into effect. And because you're blessed, you can give what you are stewarding over and above what you are returning to God. And the principles of multiplication will come into effect. And your life will prosper because this is God's plan for you. Are we going to do what God has asked us to do. Trust him. Try him. All it comes down to is giving to God our hearts and trusting him with what we steward and see if he is not faithful in his promises and in his word. It starts by trusting God. Did you guys get something out of that today? So simple. So easy. You got to let it get blessed by God. Got to give it so that it returns blessed by God. Principles of multiplication, so good. Well, hey, listen, before we leave today, we got so many special events and so many special activities planned uh, in the service. Everything's going a little out of order. So I just want to ask you, please, give me a moment. You don't have to get up. You don't have to leave. Nobody has to get up and leave in this place in a moment. I mean, we're not even, we're not even halfway done, okay? Let me just give you, just uh, take a moment here, and let's just do something very important. I don't know everybody in this place. We saw a lot of visitors' hands today. On top of the visitors, I don't know every person in this room. I wish I could. I wish I did. But it would be a shame for us to leave today under the pretenses that everybody's okay or everybody's in the right position or place with God when really you're not. So I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you to do something. I want you to examine your heart, to examine your life. I want you to answer this question honestly and openly in your own heart and see where you come, where you land. The question is this. If you were to leave today and you were to die, I know sometimes it's very hard to think about. Sometimes it's, it, it's, it's even impossible. I was told by one person to comprehend if you're young. But just to examine the reality of your mortality, at some point in your life, we're all one incident, we're all one accident, we're all one epidemic away from our eternal destiny. If you were to leave this place and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? That's a very simple question. But you see, how you answer, what you draw as a conclusion to that answer says a lot about your position with God. And so let's examine that. Let's go through that. Let's look at those answers. 
Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you hope or because you think or because you want or because you wish. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say because you have the greatest desire in life to get to heaven means that you're going to get to heaven. You can't get there because you have a positive outlook on life. Listen, nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because, you know, your parents took you to church as a child, you were baptized or christened as a baby, you went to catechism or Sunday school classes. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that that's going to get you into heaven? You can't get to heaven. You won't find that in the Bible. You know, oftentimes we think, well, you know, Pastor Luke, I go, I'm a Christian. I, I go to church. I've given myself the title of Christian. I go to church. I hear the pastor preach. I carry my Bible. I even volunteer in the children's ministry or the youth ministry. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you sit in a church and hear the pastor preach that you're going to get to heaven? Nowhere does it say that because you've given yourself a title. Oh, my goodness, in America, we love to label ourselves. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you've given yourself a label, I'm a Christian, that that means you're going to get to heaven? Just because you've got a cross around your neck or because when they asked you on the census, you wrote that in? Or because maybe you've got a tattoo of a scripture reference somewhere on your body, only God can judge me or something like that? I know people who think that that's good enough. Nowhere in God's word is, will you find that that will get you into heaven. Why? Because it's not about labels. It's not about uh, uh, titles. I can label myself a car and sit in my garage, but at no point in my life am I ever going to be a car. Come on. You know, so often what happens is we think, well, I live in America, you know, and by a system of default classifications, our money says in God we trust. And, and you know, uh, the president always says, God bless America in his speeches. And, uh, you know, so I always thought that because I wasn't a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim, that always meant that I was a Christian and that I was going to go to heaven because of that. Nowhere in the word of God, nowhere in God's holy word will you find that because you're not a Buddhist, a Hindu, or a Muslim, or some other type of world religion or classification, that by default you're going to get to heaven. It does not exist to tell you that because you can't get to heaven that way. So what we think is we think, well, if I'm a good person, if I stand for social justice, if I try to help out my fellow human being, if I stand up for what is right, do the best I can to, 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 to take care of my family and my friends, if I'm a good person, good people go to heaven. But did you know that nowhere in God's word does it say that good people go to heaven? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God's righteousness are like filthy rags. You see, nothing we could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Why? Because the Bible, unfortunately for us, tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have fallen short of God's expectations and standards for entrance. You can, what that means is you can't earn it, you can't buy it, you can't work for it, you don't deserve it, no matter what you do, you on your own self will never meet the expectations that God holds to enter heaven. But that doesn't have to be the end or the final answer. Because you see, we can't get to heaven your way or some well-meaning author's way or church committee's way. The only way you and I can get to heaven is God's way. And Jesus Christ is that way. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So today I want to give you the opportunity to accept, the Bible tells us, the gift of God is eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. I want to give you the opportunity in just a moment to accept the gift of God and Jesus Christ into your heart and your life to ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever, ever, leaving hell behind. Well, I don't know if that even exists. Can I tell you something? Burying your head in the sand about the topic doesn't make it go away. It's a very real place, real enough for God to teach us about it, real enough for Jesus to tell about it, real enough for you and I to understand over thousands of years the Bible being preserved so that we could take it seriously today. Jesus says these words. In John, the third chapter, he says, in order to inherit the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Born again, what does that mean? Not what Hollywood or cultures made it out to be. It means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart, you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God, the Father, through his son, Jesus Christ. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to the church, to you and I. Jesus says, when I'm coming back, I'm going to come back one day and I'm going to find you. I better find you hot or I better find that you're cold. He says, if I find that you're lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Oh my goodness, it's a shocking statement. And it's Jesus' final plea in the word of God for humanity to stop doing life on our own and start doing it God's way. Listen, you've lived life your way long enough. Struggled and toiled and tried to fill that emptiness on the inside of you with money, with possessions, with friends, with relationships, only to realize that no matter how much you thirst, you can never quench that thirst. Why? Because the hole on the inside of you, the emptiness, is a God-sized hole designed to be filled by Jesus Christ. And he says, when I come back, I'd rather find that you're hot or I'd rather find that you're cold because if you're lukewarm, so stop trying to do things your way. What does lukewarm mean? It means that you've got your ups and your downs and your ins and your outs, occasional church attendance, doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You know, casual Christianity, come on. Let's be real today. I love you enough, I respect you enough today to tell you the truth. You can't get to heaven because of your mental ascent towards God. Can't to get, get to heaven because of your carnal knowledge of who he is. Can't get to heaven because you attend church. Today, it's an all or nothing relationship. 
And I want to give to you the opportunity. I'm going to make it so easy on you today. The easiest you can possibly do today. We're going to pray together in your seats. That's it. Because we've got so many different things going on today. We're going to pray together. And I want to give you the opportunity. Jesus said these words. If you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. He says, but if you deny him, he will deny you. Today I want to give you the opportunity. Here's what I'm going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'll go one, two, and then I'll go three. And I'll smack my hands together. And when I do, you've got to just do something very simple. You've got to make a decision. Pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand, you're saying, you know what? I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I'm a man. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it and put it right back down. Ah, if I raise my hand, I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm not going to embarrass you. We're going to pray with you in your chairs today. It's as easy as it gets, simple as it gets today. But it starts by making that decision. What you're doing by raising your hand is you're making the decision to follow Jesus. Who should raise your hands? If you're not sure, get sure. Maybe you've never given your heart. You've never given your life to Jesus Christ. If that's you in just a moment, wherever you're at, just pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it and put it right back down. Maybe you did this as a child or at a harvest crusade or, a, or a, you prayed that prayer once before on TV, but you've never really followed through with it. Listen, don't walk out of this place without ensuring your destiny with God is in right alignment. Who should raise your hands if you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing? If you've been running from God instead of to God, come on. Let's quit playing games with God today. Let's do it God's way today, no longer your way. Let's get right with God. All across this auditorium, from the front to the back, from the side to the side, you guys in the family rooms, I can see you through the windows. If you're at home watching on the live stream or you're on the campus watching around on the television screens or hear the sound of my voice, wherever you're at, this is your moment, this is your time. You've had doctors and dentist appointments, now it's a divine appointment between you and God. Today is the day of your salvation. It starts by making that decision we'll follow through together. So I'm gonna count to three. When I do, if that's you, get ready, pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, and put it right back down and we'll go forward together from there. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Three. Let me see your hands in this place today. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight wise people. Nine, ten. I see you back there. Eleven. All right. Eleven wise people. Thirteen. I see. Or twelve. Thirteen. I see you guys. Fourteen. I got you back there in the back. Fourteen wise people. Okay. How about you over here? Fifteen. All right. Over here in the, the side. Give me a little wave. So I, I got you back there. I got you. Fifteen wise people. Sixteen back there. Seventeen. I see you waving at me, my man. I got you. Seventeen wise people. Anybody else? You say, man. I wonder if I should. All right. Eighteen. I see you right over here. Praise God. 19 in the back. I got you. Where are you at? You say, man, I wonder if I should. You should. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. This is your moment. This is your time. I see you right there. Number 20. Where are you at? You're saying, I wonder if I should. Ushers are pointing over in this direction. Where are you at? Give me a little. I got you. I got you already there in the back. Number 20. Where are you at? You say, man, I wonder if I should. I see you right there. 21 wise people. Anybody else in this place? You say, man, I wonder if I should. Yep. Yep. You should. Your time. Anybody else today? We're going to pray together right now. Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 20 wise people. I see a hand over there as well, 22. Here's what we're going to do. We're all going to pray together. Very simple. Even if you're at home watching on the live stream, you can just pray with us too. Here's what we're going to do. We're all in a moment going to pray this prayer. Listen, God doesn't listen to the words of your mouth. It's not some abracadabra magical prayer formula that gets you into heaven. All right? It's the prayers of your heart. That's what God listens to, not the words of your mouth. So we're going to pray this. and want you to believe this with your heart. Confess this with your mouth. The Bible says that you shall be saved. So we're all going to pray. I'm going to ask every person in this place to repeat this after me. Let's do this. Let's all bow our heads. Let's all close our, eyes, close our eyes. And let's go before the Lord and pray. Every person repeat this after me, whether you raise your hands or you didn't. So that way we can all do it together. But repeat this words after me. Father God, I come before you and I acknowledge that I need you. I acknowledge that I need Jesus. I invite Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, came to the earth, died on the cross, rose on the third day, and is seated in heaven. I believe that He is the Son of God, my Savior. Fill me today with your Holy Spirit. I ask in the name of Jesus, you would forgive me of my sins. The sins I've committed, the sins I didn't even know I commit. Wash me today with the blood of Jesus. I am clean. I am whole. I am healed. I'm a Christian. Headed for heaven. Leaving hell behind. I am saved. Amen. Yeah, all right. Congratulations. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord 
and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.